It is my honor to, to introduce uh, Dr. Carol McFarlane. Uh, she's the Senior Program Officer and Director of the Andrew W. Mellon and Thomas R. Pickering programs at the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation. Come to us all the way from Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, tremendous uh, community activist uh, in the Princeton area. Uh, she teaches a, a whole range of courses for women and uh, for, uh, she teaches a, a trainer, uh, uh, develops training teams for work overseas in the Caribbean. Um, she's a native of Queens, New York, and a graduate of Queens College, uh, and uh, was a recipient of many awards, and indeed, including a Mellon Mays undergraduate fellowship. Those of you involved with the Mellon Mays program, you have a fellow, Mel a, a fellow Mellon right here. Her doctoral work was at Rutgers University uh, with uh, studying 20th century uh, uh, African diaspora literature and she's done some intriguing research on the author Toni Morrison, uh, particularly unpacking a lot of her works, not just as literature, but as historical works. Uh, and uh, some very interesting work there. She's taught not only literature and writing, but debate, public speaking classes uh, at Princeton and at Rutgers and at Princeton Day School, uh, has been a test developer for ETS. She's an academic leader, and we are honored and fortunate to have her with us. So join me in welcoming Dr. Kareel McFarland. Good morning. It is my delight and honor to be here with you. Um, I did not bring this weather. <laughs> I have to protest. Look around at those who are seated near to you. What do you see? Do you see neighbors, friends, colleagues, teachers, peers? I see people with the potential to be anything that they desire and to do whatever they set their minds to achieve. What do you see? Is your vision clouded by circumstances, by want, by need, by past and present abuses? What do you see? What I hope to do today is to begin to clear some of those Seattle-like clouds. <laughs> I hope to begin to inspire you to pursue whatever your dreams may be. Dreams that are crystal clear. Dreams that pierce through your circumstances, laser into your wants, and reflect your burning passion. Dreams for your future, dreams with a hope. Dreams which, when fulfilled, can change the world. Those kinds of dreams. So what are your dreams? Many of you students are here this morning as awardees recipients of an honor which you have earned and which you deserve. Congratulations. But is that honor, are those awards, your end point or a beginning? So what is your dream? Some of us here today had dreams of what we might have accomplished what we would be in the future, and what we envisioned perhaps when we were students or children. But as we have encountered the circumstances and difficulties of life and run into the mundaneness of the quotidian, we've lost sight of our dreams and maybe laid them aside. What is your dream? While you contemplate that question, I want to tell you a story. A story which has served to inspire me and many others 
Whether you're actively pursuing your dreams, have given up on them, or never perhaps have even formulated one, this story is about the pursuit of a dream which seemed impossible, but against all kinds of odds was fulfilled. It's a story about my parents. My parents are from the twin island nation of Trinidad and Tobago. Brighton for you there in the square because it's so tiny. They grew up under British rule. It was a British colony until 1962. What was that like? It was quite similar to the slave culture in America for both here and there. Those in power sought to instill the notion that white British culture was the standard of rightness and the level of excellence to strive for. They effectively infused the Trinidadian culture with the idea that the closer you were to that white standard, the better you were as a person. The implications were far reaching, especially in terms of appearance. If you were light complexioned with straight hair, then you were better because you were closer to the standard. Better than someone who was darker complexioned with curly hair. So while light and dark skinned persons interacted without restriction in Trinidad, there was often a sense of inferiority or superiority because internalized racism had taken root. That is a picture of my father. He's a dark complexioned man. It was therefore assumed that he would never amount to anything. When he was born, they called him Baba, as in Baba, black sheep. Mm. He was seen and treated as the black sheep of the family, even as a child. He did not rece receive respect or love from the majority of his peers or teachers, from his neighbors, his aunts, his uncles, and even his mother. He was rejected. He was beaten by adults just randomly for no reason at all and with no provocation simply because of his color. And he was constantly told that he was bad. So what did he do? How did he respond to these outrages? He fought. He fought physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. He fought. He subverted the negativity, used the hostility to inspire him, and to drive him to achieve. He determined that he was going to reach the highest level of education possible in Trinidad and abroad, use that knowledge and training to go back to Trinidad and address the issues he saw as urgent, specifically working with those children who were like himself. Neglected, abused, and assumed to be less than. He purposed it in his heart, he fixed his face like a flint, and he moved forward. First point. Have you been labeled? Have you been designated as less than? As inferior, as incapable? Do others assume that you cannot and you will not ever achieve more than a menial job even if you do graduate from heritage? Do not believe it. Don't accept it. Don't accept the label that others may have placed on you. Instead, know and believe in yourself. After he completed his elementary education, my father was to move on to the equivalent of high school. They were under a British system, so I won't go into all the details of that. But the essential point is, it was the equivalent of what we would call high school. But as one of 10 children from a very poor family, they did not have the money to pay for him to go to high school. So what did he do? He approached the principal of the school that he wanted to attend, and they worked out a deal. He said, if you let me go to school, I will not only do well, but I will pay you back if you pay for my school when I graduate. And so that's what happened. They let him go to school on credit, and he promised that he would pay back every penny as soon as he received employment. He hand copied books, if you can even believe that, long into the nights, 
using an oil lamp, no electricity at that point. He stayed up to study, and he indeed scored high marks, and he finished high school against the odds. Second point. If the door to the opportunity which you are seeking seems to be closed, knock on it. Opportunity does not always come knocking on your door. Sometimes you have to knock on the door yourself. And when someone answers, be prepared to do whatever it takes to take advantage of the opportunity without compromising your principles. Back to the story. Now at that point in time, in the early 1950s, the next step after high school for Trinidadians was the advanced exam. There was not a university in the country, if you can even believe that. So passing the advanced exam would be the highest level of education that you could achieve. This is where my mother enters the story. <laughs> she was the person from whom my father borrowed books to study for his advanced exams. He's He used the book borrowing as an excuse <laughs> to talk to my mother, on whom he'd had his eyes for some time. He also wanted to take and pass the exam so he could secure a teaching position. My mother, who was also studying for the advanced exam, exam agreed to lend him the books and to study with him. Sha, sha, sha. <laughs> the relationship began in earnest. But my mother, with the support of her parents, did not allow the relationship, listen well, especially ladies, to distract her from focusing on her studies. Point three. <laughs> I've seen it too many times. When the door of opportunity opens, don't miss the chance offered because of a love interest. Trust me, it's usually fleeting. Don't allow it to so consume your time and attention that you neglect your studies and you forget or lose sight of your goal. Keep going. Back to the story. So both of my parents passed their exam and secured teaching positions. My dad continued teaching until a better opportunity arose. A job in the oil field. There was an announcement made promising an advanced position on the oil fields for a native. Since the British dominated the senior positions, most Trinidadians were relegated to menial labor. So this was an opportunity. The announcement intoned. <coughs> if you can learn in six weeks the skills and the knowledge needed to work in the labs, you will be promoted to the level of a researcher. The assumption was that the native Trinidadians couldn't learn it anyway. And in six weeks, out of the range of possibility. Ah, so my father left his teaching position and he engaged in the required track. He started out on the oil fields, making the handsome salary of 17 cents an hour, which was more than he was making as a teacher. Mm. If he received this promotion, for which he was working hard, it gets better, he would receive an increase in salary to 19 cents an hour. Who wouldn't want that? <laughs> so he finished the material in a week and a half. And with quite a bit of argumentation, he was given the promotion. Don't accept the status quo. He could have stayed as a teacher. He saw an opportunity, he took, it advanta he took advantage of it. So when opportunities arise, take advantage of them. Back to the story. Wedding bells soon told for my parents. And they jointly decided to pursue higher education in the United States. My father heard about the one person in San Fernando where they grew up who had traveled to America and would be able to sponsor him. So he secured his visa 
and the funds needed to pay for a ship's fare, and in June of 1955, he arrived on the shores of New York City. He secured a job in the garment district, worked to get the money to attend college in the fall. For he and my mother had, before he left, applied to a host of Bible schools, which is where they wanted to go, and been accepted to the one institution that accepted blacks in the 1950s. That was Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. He worked all summer and through some amazing frugality was able to save enough money for bus fare to Chicago, for fare for my mother, and for room and board for the fall. As the only black people in the institution at the time, the only black people in the institution at the time, they were subjected to all kinds of unfair practices while seeking to adjust to American culture. They were asked if they really lived with the monkeys and swung from trees. They were asked if they had tails, and if so, could they show their tails? They were not allowed to live together, even though they were married. They were called names and humiliated in classes. They were ignored by their classmates, accused of cheating on exams and papers, and when it was realized that they just happened to be the best students in the entire school, they had their work stolen and attributed to other students. Point five, persevere. Regardless of the obstacles that arise, don't give up. Well, we graduated. We did it. 1957. But Moody only granted certificates and not degrees. They were determined to get a college degree. So they moved on to Wheaton College to secure their college degrees. Without enough money for tuition, they were praying for a miracle, and a miracle occurred. <laughs> They were granted a full scholarship while standing on the registration line and were able to attend Wheaton College. As two of the handful of black persons on campus, they faced various types of opposition, once again. But they did it. And they graduated in 1959, having secured their college degrees. Now remember, their goal was to achieve the highest level of education possible in Trinidad, which they had done, and to achieve the highest level of education possible in the States, and then return. So they both wanted to complete their doctorates in education as well. They realized that they would have to take turns because, as it happens, baby number one, my brother, had been born in Trinidad before they left, and baby number two was born in Wheaton. So they decided that my father would secure his degree first, and then my mother would secure hers. My father had heard that Columbia University was the best place from which to receive that degree. Though he had applied, he had not heard back from them. That didn't stop him. Since it was the best program, he decided he was going to go anyway. So they packed up all that they had, they drove from Chicago to New York, arrived in New York on a Saturday evening, were led in by the janitor into married student housing, another mercy, and on Monday morning, somehow, which he didn't explain to me, he was able to get admitted to Columbia and register for classes. <laughs> Since they were in a new city, they set about looking for work. My father found a position readily, but it wasn't very lucrative. And my mother realized that she could make a pretty decent salary if she typed doctoral dissertations. Now, I said typed, and I'm sure some of you students are saying, typed on what? The computer? No, a typewriter. A typewriter. So in those days, you had typewriters not computers, so it was a big deal to get your doctoral dissertation typed properly, and people would pay you fairly well for it. So she borrowed a typewriter and typed the first one. She made 
$140, which was the most money she had ever made at one time at that point in her life. She took her $240, marched herself over to Smith Corona, and bought, hold your breath, an electric typewriter. <laughs> it's kind of like the fastest iPad today. That's the equivalent. <laughs> she then proceeded to type as many as three dissertations a week. And that proved to be lucrative enough to allow my father to leave his job focus on his studies, and therefore accelerate the process. With my mother's support, he received his EDD in 1963. He was almost immediately offered a position at Gibbs Junior College in Florida. He accepted the job, drove the family to Florida. And I'll tell you about that trip on a separate occasion. <laughs> you can just imagine, though. The college closed precipitously, and my father took the opportunity then to return to New York and become more involved in the civil rights movement. Although he and my mother had never lost sight of their goal of returning home, they also wanted to assist in the movement for civil rights in America. Additionally, two more of my siblings had been born along the way, and the fifth was soon to arrive, that's me. <laughs> they decided that a return to New York would also allow my mother to pursue her doctorate in education at Columbia. So they worked together in Harlem, while slowly but surely, my mother pursued her degree. By the time I was old enough to recollect details, she had finished her coursework and worked on her dissertation every single day. Even if it was 10, 15, or 20 minutes, she read something, she wrote something, she did something to complete that dissertation every day. And finally, in nine, I'm sorry, yes, 1979, almost eight years after she began, long process, she completed her degree. And we were all very proud. Point number six, no matter how long it takes, no matter how many obstacles you may encounter, no matter what your other obligations are, take the time every day to work on that project. And before you know it, you reach your goal. After my parents had achieved their educational goals, they did not want to disrupt our lives by returning to Trinidad. So they decided they would wait until their last child, graduated from college. So when I graduated from Queens College in 1991, they returned home. And they've been working in Trinidad ever since, with those children who they set out to aid in the first place, those who are neglected, abused, seen as less than. They provide counseling to adults, advise the government about educational outlook, of the nation, and they teach others about the importance of perseverance. My parents have served as an inspiration for me. I hope that this sketch of their story has also served to inspire you. Thank you.